Welcome back to the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We are back once again. I'm Derek Rackley, joined by my guys DJ Shockley and Dave Archer to recap a Falcons loss, a defeat 30-17 to to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at home. Before we get into that, let's give you the quick rundown of what we got going on today. I'll have the guys give us their quick reactions on what they thought about the game last week. And we'll talk about some of the missed opportunities, probably the biggest storyline in that game. We talked all along, you've got to be so sharp. The margin for error is so slim, especially when you're playing up against the Tom Brady-led offense, and they made a couple too many mistakes. What's ahead for Atlanta Falcons as they face this week and for the final five games of the season as they are still, oddly enough, in a playoff mix here, guys. Yeah. We'll um, – on the heels of a big man Falcons touchdown right before the end of the first half, we'll talk a little story time about some some maybe familiar big man touchdowns, big man moments across the NFL, or maybe it's across other sports. I don't quite know. And then we will talk about the opponent this week, who are the Panthers right now as Atlanta faces them this weekend. So, guys, let's talk about this game. I talked about it. Atlanta Falcons come up short, 30-17 to to Tom Brady and company. I say Tom Brady because he had an absolute of a delight game. Really no surprise from the GOAT. Dave, quick reactions on what your synopsis was on the game. A sentence or two? I'll give you two. I, I think just the anal- his ability to adjust to what Atlanta wanted to do defensively. Atlanta knew that they couldn't match up personnel-wise against that really good receiver core and back, so they decided to play zone and tried to kind of bend, 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 don't break, and try to win on third down. And Brady adjusted. They they like explosives. They had 87 explosives coming in. He went ahead and threw the ball underneath. 300 and, or whatever yards on 51 attempts. I think it came out to seven yards an attempt. Uh, he adjusted. Did you uh, – were you counting sentences? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if they were, like, uh, <laughs> extended or, like, I don't know if they had commas. Or it's anything. okay. See, I gave him two. It's a run-on sentence. And it's kind of like I knew Dave was going to stretch it a little bit more, but it's it's okay. <laughs> Who made Mr. Ga- Grammar Police over here? <laughs> right? All right. So, it's I your turn. I only do this because early in the year when we did this, he crushed me for doing it. You talked for four or five minutes. <laughs> see? 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 <laughs> All right, DJ. Your turn. You're on the clock. Dave is paying attention for periods. Go. <laughs> He's looking at me. Let me get my timer on this. Go ahead. I'll say uh, the inability to sustain that run game. And we talked about it in the first half where you rushed for 101 yards and you were averaging over nine and a half yards to carry in the first half. And you rushed for 20 more yards in the entire ball game. And obviously that was a big issue in the second half. But uh, I think that inability – I know this was a good front. Yeah, uh, we admit that. But – you did it fine in the first half. You just weren't able to do it in the second can half. I, can I piggyback back on that? Because there was the bulletin board material this week about Bruce Arians saying nobody runs on us. I don't care who we are. Do you feel like the Falcons kind of flex themselves, like the shoulders came out, chest came out a little bit, and saying, wait a minute, we've been running the ball okay, and they kind of wanted to put it to them in the first half, and then maybe Tampa got back to their style of stifling run defense in the second half, Dave? Do you think it was a challenge for Atlanta? Well, I think anytime you hear something like that, if in fact you digested that information and said, wait a minute, you know, we're going to run. You ran it for 150 yards a weekend before. Yeah, that was not the, the Tampa Bay defense, the number one rush defense in the in the conference or in, in the league, really. But this is a defense that had gotten touched up the last five games anyway. So mm-hmm. I think that was a message to his guys. I don't mm-hmm. think he was talking to the Falcons. Yeah. He was talking, we don't let anybody run us. He was talking to his own people. Yeah, one of those uh, subliminal messages, yeah. if you will, saying uh, the defense that we've been showing has not been good enough. So let's move on, talk about some of the missed opportunities. Guys, there's plenty of options to choose from, unfortunately, in this type of game. Uh, there was a fumble by Russell Gage. There was a missed opportunity deep in Tampa Bay territory, I believe, at the one-yard line. Um, there was a little bit of a fumble that Cordero Patterson was actually very upset about, and the ball right bounced right back up into his hands, and he still picks up eight or nine yards. Right. I think that's a good thing <laughs> when when a guy like that in the season that he's having was upset about that play. Um, I d- doubt that one's going to come to your mind. But, D- DJ, let me start with you. What was the most – the, the, the biggest play or biggest missed opportunity in that game where the Falcons could have taken advantage? For me, it goes to the situation inside the one-yard line. Yeah. And I say that because this is a ball game where we came into – okay, on this show talking about playing against Tom Brady, you know they're going to score touchdowns. And you need to score touchdowns. you got three plays inside the one-yard line. And because of your own snafus, you don't end up getting the football in the end zone and you end up having to kick a field goal. At that time, it was 13-7. to seven. You kicked the field goal, and now it's 13-10. to 10. Well, you know what happens the next series? 
they throw it to Gronk, they go down and score, now it's 20 to 10. So mm -hmm. you look at we kick field goals, they score touchdown. That's the that's a big part of the ball game where you miss an opportunity to change the scope of it. If you score a touchdown there, you go up 14-13, and the feel is a little bit different that you're in the ball game. It's a win for them inside the one yard line that you only give up three points. They feel good about that. Now they drive right back down and and get seven. Now you're down ten instead of being up. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think the the biggest thing that you mentioned there, DJ, is we got three opportunities. Well, it actually ended up being two, yeah. right? Because of their own snafu, a center quarterback exchange, which is like the last thing that you're thinking could happen to you in that situation. If Arthur Smith is looking at it, yeah, the first play that he dials up, he's hoping that they score. Right. But if he doesn't, he's saying, I've got two more chances. Right. And then all of a sudden he sees this fumble on the ground, Dave, and he's saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> all right? I mean, that's kind of what coaches are saying, whether it's audibly said or wasted. in, in between their ears. Yes, it's absolute wasted play. So I'm sure you would agree that was a big missed opportunity. Mm. But was there another one that you felt like was something that they needed to capitalize on? Well, it's probably the one you pointed out. You, you found a way to get the score at the end of the half because Marlon Davidson makes the play to make it 20-17. to 17. So you think, okay, we kind of got one back right there because you guys, the thing you were talking about was happening in the first half, the kind of the snafu there. So now you're going to get your opening possession of the third quarter and you're moving. Ryan scrambles up in the pocket, finds Gage over the middle, and Desir comes in and strips the ball out. You're inside the Tampa 35 yard line with a score 20 to 17. Mm -hmm. You're at the very worst, is going to get a, a young way coup field goal attempt, and you like the chances of him banging that through. You may go down and score a touchdown. And do what Chalk's talking about, putting the onus back on Tampa's offense up 24 to 20. But the fumble took that opportunity away from you. Now, Tampa did not score after getting the ball, but still, it took an opportunity away from you. And we talked about it all last week. You were going to have to play your cleanest football game to win yeah. this game. Yeah, especially like you mentioned, Dave, they did not score off of that turnover. But if they continue to drive, they put seven points mm -hmm. on the board again. It's it's all about a momentum, which is something that's hard to quantify at any stage of the game. But they punch it in for a touchdown. Where is the defense at when they come back on the field? Do they end up getting a stop, giving it back to Atlanta? Then where does Atlanta feel after they had just mm -hmm. driven down and scored a touchdown? Interesting, too, about that play, Dave. Pierre Desir had just come into the game. Jamel Dean went down That's with right. an injury, and he that was his very first wow. play. So give him credit because it was almost like he knew exactly what to do. When they showed the replay, he came around, and his hand went right up underneath Gage, and he knew that he was trying to knock that football out. You'd think a guy, granted, Pierre Desir's been in the league for a little while, so he's a veteran. He knows what he's doing. But maybe he's just trying to play catch-up. Yeah. Maybe he just tries to make the tackle. Instead, he ends up going for the punch out, and he's successful with it. So – Definitely a big missed opportunity right there. We're talking about two drives there, the goal line drive and driving down on a third down conversion with Gage that likely end up in points, maybe even 14 that's missed from the Atlanta Falcons. So, guys, let's just talk about this because, again, we've mentioned on many of occasions, unfortunately after losses, that the coaches and the players in that building are making adjustments right now on how they can learn from some of those missed opportunities and apply that moving forward. So let's talk about what the remainder of this season looks like. As you look at it, you're looking at a team that has five wins right now, and they're. it's almost like, should we talk about playoffs the way that they're playing right now? But the nature of the beast is they are still legitimately in the hunt. Right. The only problem is... Three of the teams that are ahead of them right now have the head-to-head -head advantage against mm -hmm. them right now. Yeah. So, obviously, you have to put a run together no matter what the situation looks like. But I think if you look at the combined record of the five teams remaining on the Falcons' schedule, it's 24-34-1, and, <laughs> and only one of those teams has a winning record above 500 right now, which is the Buffalo Bills. So, Dave... Put a prediction out or what needs to happen throughout the rest of this season, these last five games, to put Atlanta into position to maybe the last two weeks of the season they can get into the postseason. Yeah, I think you have to win the next three, Rack. I think you have to go out, and, and this has been a good road team. you got two in a row on the road. You're going to go to Carolina. You're going to go to San Francisco. Then you get the Lions here in Atlanta the day after Christmas. They just won their first game ironically, against one of those teams that had a tiebreaker over Atlanta is the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. So it can happen. Do you talk about playoffs with what the way this team's going? Absolutely, because why do we play the game? Yeah, You're playing the game to get in the postseason dance, and if you can find a way to win three of the next five or four of the next five, which is very doable, 
I get it. We just lost. Very doable. You look up and you're nine and eight, eight and nine, whatever gets you into that seventh spot, sixth spot in the playoffs. Absolutely, it's it's manageable. I think that has to be the goal. You want to play meaningful games in December. Atlanta's doing that. Or is it is it pretty? No, but there's been you have a chance because you've done some things early in the year that have built the resume up to where you have an opportunity to play something, play for something in December and January. All, all they can do is play their schedule, mm-hmm. and they can you know this could be a year that they take advantage of the fact that the NFC is a little bit down as far as the middle to the bottom half of the conference. So DJ, is it as simple as winning the first three games? I like what you're saying, Dave, because this is a time of the season where. Guys try to figure out, what am I playing for? Yes, you want everybody to be a pro. Yes, you want everybody to understand their job is to go out and compete and give 110% each day. But if you can phrase it that, guys, we still have playoffs in the future. If we take care of our business, it can happen. Is that the right way to approach it? Absolutely. And I think the reality of where the Falcons are right now, you look at the way they played this season, they played pretty good football on the road. You got three of those games on the road. And you're talking about you got the two games at home versus Detroit and New Orleans. New Orleans is a team you've already beat. You went into their place and beat them. So there's confidence when you play New Orleans at the end of the season in your own building. But three games you have played, three games you have to play on the road, you should feel really good about, hey, this is a squad that understands how we need to win, but we've done it on the road. When sometimes you think about, oh, it's easy to do it at home. Well, it's been easy for – I'd say easy, but it's been – a. Uh, uh, something that's been a value for the Falcons when they've gone on the road to win these ball games. That you know, you got to go to Carolina, got to go to San Fran, a, a, a team that you know a lot of these guys have seen before, know that style of play uh, in San Fran. So it's going to be interesting to see. But I think this team has what it takes to go on the road and win. Like Arch mentioned, at least those three ball games when you go out. And Buffalo hasn't been, you know, world beaters. Exactly. I mean, they, they've had their times where <clears throat> they struggle. I mean, we talk about they lost to Jacksonville, a team that everybody. Gave them no chance to. So, as we know, at any given day, any team can go out and win. Three of those teams that I mentioned that currently have the head-to-head, of course, Philadelphia lost earlier this season, Washington as well earlier this season, and Carolina, right? So, if you want to take the coach's perspective and say we worry about the next game on our schedule – yeah, you worry about the Carolina Panthers. Yep. You beat them this weekend. You kind of head-to-head. You even that up. You get yourself in a better position with the playoffs, and you can't worry about what happened to Washington in Philadelphia, but you can do something about what happened against Carolina. So that's kind of how things shake out for the last five weeks of the season. But you're right. You got to win one first, and then, like Dave says, if they can win the next three and continue to play well on the road mm-hmm. like they've done all season, they'll be in position when it comes down to the end of the season. So. We did see in the game last weekend, it's not always the the fast, the lean, or even the big (laughs) tight ends that get into the end zone. Sometimes Uh the big fellas, meaning real big, like Marlon Davin said big, end up at the right place, the right time, and they've got just enough athleticism to get their hands on the ball and get into the end zone. So we're not going to break down that play. We're going to have a little story time and have the guys tell us a moment in their career or a memory that they have where they were like big man touchdowns are so fun to watch. Whether it's the catch, it's the run, it's the stumble into the end zone or all the above, Dave. You got an example for us of a great big man TD. Yeah, we were playing Dallas uh, in Dallas. Had never beaten the Cowboys in Dallas. A close football game. Danny White drops the throw, gets hit, and the ball kind of pops in the air, and Mike Gann catches it, the Falcons defensive end out of Notre Dame, and he's running down the field, and he's carrying it. He doesn't even know how to tuck it away, so he's carrying it like this, and he's running <laughs> – <laughs> and this guy kind of peels off him, and he's able to get that guy off him, and he's and he gets into the end zone, and he's so excited he wants to spike it. And when he gets ready to spike it, it shoots that way. It just kind of <laughs> squirts out of his hand. He didn't even get a – so then he did a pseudo spike. He didn't have the ball, you know, a fake spike. He was so excited to get in the end zone. It ended up being a huge play for us. We ended up beating Dallas 37-35 in the game, and it was a huge play by Mike Gann. But he was so excited to have the football in his hands, he didn't know what to do with it. And it ended up over there someplace because he couldn't <laughs> hold on to it to spike it. But a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> DJ, you got a good example for us. Yeah, I'm going to go back to, to the college days. And I'm going to go back to, uh, obviously, I was thinking about like a refrigerator parry or something. Everybody's seen that before. You know, the almost touchdown uh, by Leon Lett rolling in, rumbling, stumbling down the end zone. <laughs> but I'm going to go to this year, my Georgia Bulldogs. They gave big Jordan Davis yeah. a chance to run with the football, and they gave it to him twice. And the the great thing about it was, he's come on the field all year long, and he's been in that role where he's you know trying to roll grade a guy. He's the lead black. 
So what Georgia does is they go into this 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 odd little little, little switch of the formation, and they get a shift, and all of a sudden he is dotting the eye back there in the middle, <laughs> and the entire fan base is going crazy. But the crazy thing about it, he got stuffed on the first play. <laughs> We're inside the one yard line. He gets stuffed. Next play, you hear the crowd going for it again, going for it again. So it's fourth down. They go for it again. Uh, the first time he actually tried to dive over all 360 pounds was going. They tried to dive over him, and then the second play he ends up getting into the zone, and you just see half the team running on the field, and it was it was pretty cool to see it, especially in his senior year, had that opportunity to to get a touchdown, something he can remember forever. I've always wondered if a linebacker, when they see that situation and they see that guy going back there, if they're like. Oh gosh, oh, defensive man. line, please help me out. Like I don't want to go one on one with this guy <laughs> with a full head of steam. I mean, it's it's hard enough going up against a linebacker, maybe or excuse me, a running back, somebody like Leonard Fournette. But like yeah. you said, going up against somebody three sixty. Yeah, forget about it. That's no like George Comfey, the middle linebacker of the Green Bay Packers, hit the fridge. The fridge hit oh. him on a Monday night football and they drove him into the back of the end zone. So you're exactly oh. right. Linebackers <laughs> Do not want that opportunity. You know, it's so funny because that's like the first thing that came to my mind is the refrigerator Perry because I grew up in Minnesota. So I grew uh, up in the NFC North days watching Minnesota. And I wouldn't say that I was a diehard fan or anything, but if you were born and raised in Minnesota, you're generally a Vikings and a Twins fan. That's just yeah. what happens, right? Yeah. And I used to always see those games when the fridge would come in and it was like you knew on a goal line situation. <laughs> and it was just like you could tell the defense – the fridge is getting the ball. Neck roll it Make off. the play. <laughs> Can you get him down on the ground? And so I had to pull it up. And it's interesting because there was a day that the fridge was considered huge, right? <laughs> Wikipedia, take it for what it's worth, says he's 6'2", 335. There's a lot of guys that are that big now. No, no question. Right? Yeah, that big I mean, now. Jordan Davis towers over the top of him. No doubt. Um, I not had 6'2", 335 fall on me in 1985. <laughs> that was not good. It so. doesn't feel good. Yeah, no. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that hopefully that for Marlon Davidson's sake, that won't be his last touchdown. And maybe he will end up being the subject of a big man touchdown discussion one day down the road. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. All right, so we talked about it this weekend. Panthers, uh, Falcons go on the road. They get a little bit of revenge. Cam, the starting quarterback. You talked about this about four or five weeks ago. You said pretty good chance that Cam Newton is a starting quarterback when the Falcons face off with him the second time. So kind of break down, Dave. You, we talked about it right before we came on the air, but who are the, the Panthers right now? We know there's no Christian McCaffrey. That obviously helps anybody that faces against them. But who are they defensively, key players, our areas of opportunity for Atlanta to win this game. Well, first thing to you've mentioned Cam Newton. Joe Brady was just released as their offensive coordinator this week in Carolina, so they are now changing the guard as to who's going to be calling plays. Joe Brady, that celebrated OC or celebrated assistant that came off that 2019 national championship team, he wasn't the play caller at LSU, and evidently that has been part of the problem in Carolina. So they'll shift gears there. Cam Newton's had a horrible day the last time out two, two Sundays ago, so they're going to have to regroup there. But as a de when you look at the defensive side of the football, it's a smaller defense that uh, has a couple of big guys in the middle that are big. Most people remember Derrick Brown, yep. uh, the big guy at Auburn. He's yep. playing in the middle. He was the running mate with Marlon Davidson mm -hmm. in the interior of that Auburn mm -hmm. defense. He's a stout player. We had a tough time moving him last time. But they've got edge guys that are quick. The away kid from Penn State's outstanding off the edge. Uh, Brian Burns out of Florida State, both yep. smallish guys that can rush the passer. And then they got Shaq Thompson, who's developed into uh, quite, a, quite a linebacker. He's a yep. guy who's a safety in college that they moved to linebacker when he arrived there, much like Thomas Davis. Remember yeah. Thomas Davis oh, out of absolutely. Georgia? They moved him from safety to linebacker. They've done the same thing with Shaq. He's running side on side. They've got one of my favorite players defensively, a guy named Jeremy Chin, who plays safety. Yeah. That's about 215, 220 pounds that can run, Leonard that can Box come down, and he will probably. There's a good <laughs> chance he might draw the assignment uh, on Kyle Pitts. I would not be surprised if you didn't see Jeremy Chin draw some of the man-to-man -man coverage there. 
But this is not a world-beating group, certainly not on the offensive side of the football. The problem with it last time is Atlanta didn't est establish no run game against this defense last time, and they're not big enough to keep you from being able to run it on them. So I would think, based on what we saw in the first half of this game, Shockey pointed out, and what you saw last week against Jacksonville, this will be a much better run uh, effort by Atlanta. I think that Arthur Smith told me post game that he thinks they're improving dramatically in the run game, albeit they didn't run it very well in the second half of this last game. Yeah, you talked about it, Dave. You're not going to face against Vita Vea and Indomitian Sue and Jason Pierre-Paul every week in the NFL. Not to say that Carolina doesn't have some dudes, mm -hmm. as you outlined. There's still some good players, but – if they can get Cordero Patterson, Mike Davis, to rip off a couple of runs like they did against Tampa, DJ, what does that do for Atlanta to give them the best chance to stay balanced and win this game? Well, I think the number one thing, it allows you to protect your quarterback a little bit better because now the defense is forced to be able to have to stop the run. You get a lot of maybe more guys coming up and being more passive as far as not trying to get too far afield because of the run game. And if you can run the football, like you mentioned, I mean, this was we mentioned we've said it a couple of times that unit was a little bit special that we played in, in last week and five sacks is, is never acceptable but this is a ball game where I feel like the offensive line will take the onus to say we have to protect our quarterback we have any goals about us we're going to make sure that does not happen again I expect a better performance but if we can get the run game going it just adds everything else to what Arthur Smith wants to do it's something that we've seen all year long and Arthur Smith wants to be able to run the football because you you have so many things that can complement the run game that helps your offense, and then you're able to push the ball down the field. Then you're able to get the matchups you want. Then you start to get the one-on-ones where Kyle Pitts can win, where, you know, Russ Russ had, what, 11 catches in the ball game. He continued to be that guy that can, you know, maybe create some separation on the outside, and now you protect your quarterback. So the run game is crucial to a lot of the success for this Falcons offense. Dave, let me ask you this question real quick out of your experience. Carolina coming off a of bye, and there's always that, like, oh, it's the bye week. It's a chance to get our players healthy. Can you truly get anybody healthy at this point <laughs> no, in the season when you're no. in December? <laughs> if you got a guy a little bit nicked, it, you know, obviously you get by a week. You, yeah. You've been through that. Yeah. We've all been through that. Having played, if you can get a week off, you get through it. But let's face it, these guys just weren't sitting at home laying on the couch. Right. Yeah. They, were at the, they were in the weight room. They were in training. They were uh, practicing even though they didn't have a game. So it's not like they were just down and didn't do anything. But you can minimize some of the damage of not having to line up the following week. So if you got a few guys nicked, I think you feel better that next week, but that's not bringing Christian McCaffrey back, as you just said, and he's the key guy for them. Yeah. He's just They're different with him on the field. He won't be on the field in this game. Yeah, we talked about the, it's, the Atlanta's not going to face the same defense. They're not going to face the same offense either. Mm -hmm. They're not going to face an offense that has the weapons, most notably like Tom Brady and his ability to just march the football down the field. Guys, we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but – 75% of your passes when you throw it 51 times is yeah. truly impressive. And, and I, Right. Here's one other thing. I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, yeah. but when you're thinking about this game and thinking about how it's going to be different, how many times have we seen number one get up for this game? Mm -hmm. Because it's the Falcons. Because it's his hometown. And his last performance was 5 of 21. I mean, yeah. he understands that this is his maybe his last opportunity in the NFL to show that he can be a star in this league. And he's going to play against the Falcons, the hometown team, that, hey, Let's be honest, he's going to be excited to play again. So you expect a totally different cam in his ball game yeah. too as well. I would agree with that. I also saw Deion yeah. Jones knocked him into tomorrow. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see which memory that he uh, <laughs> he uh, holds on to coming into this game. Uh, so that'll wrap it up. We will uh, be back next week to talk about that game. And uh, for all the Falcons fans watching, hopefully it's a victory over the Carolina Panthers to help – Get that one of three that you talked about and to uh, get them in better position as the postseason nears as we continue through December football. Feels like we got this thing started just a few weeks ago, guys. Know, We're in yeah. December here, flies, right? Man. Time yeah. flies when you're having fun. All right, that's going to do it here on uh, the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We uh, thank you for watching on all the different venues that you get your podcasts, AtlantaFalcons.com, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, all the above, or wherever else you might find them. I don't know wherever else is, <laughs> but that's four pretty Somewhere. good options. No Shockley right. vision. Hey, speaking of which, on behalf of Shock and Arch, thanks, guys. I'm Derek Appreciate Rackley. You. We'll see you next time right here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T.